everybody, I'm Deb Antonick and welcome to another art play date. Um, this one is uh, for the new winter play date and I was really excited about being invited back for, I guess this will be a third, fourth time for me. And one of the things that I really want to say is thank you to Kelly for choosing me. And one of the fun things that Kelly did this time around is she kind of went through and, and looked at what we all do as kind of our little specialty things that we do and, and where we where we seem to have the most fun with our designs and with me I love doing snowmen and, and Kelly likes the things I do with snowmen and I don't like a snowman that's just kind of sitting there in the snow um, I kind of like to add fun little bits to the snowman and this is a design that of course once again is uh, inspired by Terry French whom I still miss dearly and one of the things that Terry always did was she always had to add things. And one of the reasons Terry and I got along so well and sort of she was able to read my mind when we talked about designs is I don't like empty space. It drives me nuts. So I like to fill all my space. So what we're going to do with this guy is we're going to fill a lot of space and we're going to do a little bit more up here. When I did my sample, I was missing a stencil that I really enjoy, which is uh, a snowflake. So. As we recreate this piece, we're going to use a couple of things that I couldn't find at the time and just bring them back in here. But we are going to do, he is, she has done on a, a chalky finish background. So I'm going to show you what we're going to use and gather our little goodies. Uh, the Deco Art Chalky Finish uh, Revive. I just love this, especially when I'm using larger surfaces. Um, it just creates a nice matte, smooth background. Um, I don't need to seal, it, it uh, takes care of everything, so we're going to do a coat in the chalky finish. Then because I wanted to have a little fun with my background, I then coated it with a co uh, coating of the weathered wood and slapped it on. And I'll show you when we're doing that. It just ended up creating a really funky little wood grain look and it just sort of in patches and then I let it dry. And then we're going to use the new DecoArt Vintage FX Wash. These new color wash paints are absolutely wonderful. Same thing, uh, raw wood, no, no um, preparation, additional preparation required. Uh, you can use it to tone down color, which is sort of what I did on here. But it just ended up being really fun. It created this really, I wasn't too sure actually what it was going to do. And it ended up creating sort of a really funky um, raised wood kind of look. So we're going to use this. And then, because I can never leave it alone and it's all about background prep, uh, we're going to use the crackle paste or the modeling paste. You can choose whatever you happen to have handy. I like the crackle paste. It's a little, got a little bit more texture to it and sort of does more things. But the modeling paste is perfectly fine for what we're going to do. And we end up, we're going to do a stencil. And then we're also going to use it for stippling the snowman and uh, to sort of create a little bit of texture so we're going to be using that and let's see what else okay we're going to need some snow text for snow on the bottom and i like to dry brush snow here and there we're going to use that and here is the funky stencil that i couldn't find and i've used this a lot in past designs and i just love it it's going to go up here so that's the stencil we're going to use it's a tracy moreau um, corner snowflake stencil one of my favorites I've used it many times you know what and by having this done in, in a different look it um, doesn't really matter what you use up in the corner it's just something to create a little decor interest and then another fun thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do some I use the liner writers and I really enjoy these I started off years ago I found the fine line applicator with the tip and then since then DecoArt has come up with their little um, tip that just is going to sit right on top of my titanium white and it does exactly the same thing so we're going to uh, be using a fine line tip to do some writing with and you know I can never leave it alone we always have to add bits so these are some bits they, they're basically the little merry minis that you can get at Michael's or I'm not too sure what Hobby Lobby calls theirs but they're all out right now in the Christmas selection usually with the little mini trees and the little you know little Christmas decorations I thought these were really cute and I use them to hang off my tree you know if you find something else that you like by all means you know let's just go for it it's all about creating some fun uh, we're gonna use a couple of buttons and some little you know the little flat uh, crystals uh, you're gonna hate it because we're gonna do a ton of little berries and 
just you know some of my my basic base coat shade highlight dry brush shade highlight some more because I can't leave it alone and uh, that's it so we're gonna get started and this particular board I got from JB Woodcrafts and this is a large piece so you're gonna find me moving it around quite a bit by all means shrink down the stencil or the, the pattern to fit on your surface it's adjustable that would just change as to maybe what size um, what size stencil you use and the little Mary Minis I mean you can go almost half size with this and still fit as long as they fit in the gap between the trees they'll be perfectly fine and you know so that's easy enough to do this particular one has grooves in the front and what they're advertising on their website and what I'm going to paint along with you is the non grooved panel so you know you can skip the berries do it on a canvas you can do whatever your little heart desires there's no right no wrong because that's what that's what um, the winter these play dates are all about using what you have and having me show you how you know we're gonna do that but one more thing before I get started with my painting I wanted to show you and I didn't do it here because they hadn't arrived yet and I was pretty stoked about them and I need them is one thing is I'm going to do a stencil on the dress so we're going to have a little polka dot stencil these are the new um, DIY decor stencils from Stampendous it creates an absolutely fabulous background and because I wanted snowflakes on my background and this is sort of up to you they're not on this one but I I had meant to go and add them after but it didn't look the same so I thought I would wait and do them in the video so this goes to show you that you can do it with or without but these create the most fabulous fun backgrounds so we're going to use one of these today but you know what by all means if you just got regular snowflakes or want to leave it alone you can go ahead so I'm going to show you how we're going to load that into our background as well so let's get started and they're going to find in this video is I'm going to speed it up in a lot of places like where I'm, I'm painting I want to do as little editing as possible but I do want to create a situation where you're watching me paint but you can't just as painstaking to watch me paint everything so we don't want to do that so I'm going to start with revive with my chalk finish paint and you know what we're not going to start with it we're going to do the stencil first because I did it after but it didn't pick up the crackle so I'm going to show you quickly so we're going to go and we're going to add the stencil make sure you pick and figure out what you want is top and what is bottom not that there's a difference really so I'm going to get my stencil out of here it's so fun I love this part and what I did is I wanted it up in the corner because the corners to me I don't like bare space so we certainly don't want to have that so we're going to use that and we're going to use our trusty little palette knife one of these guys right here and if you don't have a palette knife you know what oh let's just use an old uh, credit card well that's where all these went I have all these little credit cards you know bank cards these pretend things that come in the mail whatever these also work really good for doing your your textures and I'll show you how if you want to create a nice smooth texture that's what I love about them so I'm going to go and I'm going to get into my texture paste going to put some on my palette and I always keep it covered because we don't want it to dry up so all these paints I keep covered between so you can use your stencil or your palette knife and do a skim coat which is sort of the norm but you can also take your old credit card let's load that baby up what and this goes on so nice so you don't have to go out if you don't have it just use them my my husband I have him trained when we get all the their pretend capital one is big for that but whoever they send these little plastic cards in the mail I keep them because they're great for this they're also great for when I do decoupage so if I don't want it to be really high and I just want to have enough interest to grab the texture then I skim quite a bit off so now I'm going to take it off and I'm going to show you something totally cool another thing you're going to want to have is baby wipes baby wipes are your best friend and trust me when I talk about baby wipes I really have to wonder why we use them on baby's bums because seriously take off any excess this is drying quite quick because it was a thin coat and just wipe it off with a baby wipe 
And then, there's nothing on here, so I'm going to flip it over for my other side because, of course, it needs to be reversed. Take my card, still got stuff on it, and I'm going to build it again. Yeah, I figure as painters we should buy stock, seriously, in baby wipes. Who knew? I go to visit my grandchildren, ask my grandson to get me some baby wipes. And he was quite put out. It's the fact that those were his baby brother's baby wipes and what did grandma want with them because grandma did not wear a diaper. So I thought that was quite interesting. But it should be in the paint pile. It should be in, in, in Home Depot and stuff. I think that would be totally funny. All those big grown men looking for baby wipes. There. I'm going to take that off. And of course with my card, I could put the excess back into my jar quite quickly. Wipe my palette knife off with my baby wipes. Look at that, it just takes paint off. It's just awesome. Same as my card, I can wipe my card off. The thing with these, I don't care if they get all caked up with paint, so I'm just gonna let that happen. And then lift this off gently. A little bit there. So we're gonna let this dry, and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna start my base coat with the uh, chalk finish paint. Okay, so let's get painting. And one of my favorite brushes to paint the chalk finish paint is, is this cheap old Eye of the Tiger brush from Dynasty. I just love this brush and I've talked about it several times in the past. And the reason being is because it spreads this stuff like butter and that I just love. They're cheap, they're inexpensive. If you want to pick anything up you can just grab them from the brush guys. Uh, the link is always in, in my uh, pattern packets. And if you ever want to order brushes from the brush guys, um, we have a, do have a sort of an ongoing thing with them because we just love them and they just love us. And if you order and you put in uh, the, the discount code DEBA, you can actually save 5% off your brushes. So, you know, get a group together, order some brushes or whatever. But these things wash like rags and I just love them. So, with your paint, if you find your paint's a little bit thick for whatever reason and it's too thick, you can add, or add a little bit of water to it. In this case, it's not too bad. And I'm hoping I'm going to stay on canvas. This piece is a lot bigger than I normally would work with. So if I go off camera just at normally, I'll figure it out soon enough. So I'm going to go ahead and paint this with one coat. And this is what I like, one coat. It just spreads it. It's because it's long. It's got a snap to it, but it holds a fair bit of paint. And it just leaves the paint there, but it smooths it around as opposed to a stiffer brush that you will find will um, kind of pulls the paint off. So you could end up doing two coats. With this, you only need one coat. It's going to go on so quickly. And in a rare thing, I'm taking it right out of the jar, not putting it on my palette. There's no point. And I take a glob and I actually spread it. It's like putting icing on. It's really cool. Because it'll spread that pile of paint as opposed to pull it off and move it around. Okay, so that's painted and dry. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go and slap on a coat of weathered wood. And this we're going to do messy fast and without thought. I'm good at that. No thought. Anybody who knows me, there's not always a thought going on up there. So, I just put it on my palette. Put a big glob on there. Just going to take my handy dandy brush because it holds a lot of stuff and I'm just going to go like this. Following the grain, just blobs. Not going all over. And the reason I like this is because it just did these really weird things. So it's going on thick just quite thick. I'm using a fair bit and it is going to allow some drying time. We're going to have probably a good two or three hours, maybe even more of drying time depending on where you live. But I just thought it gave it such a neat look. Like, I, like It was one of those things that I did and I wasn't too sure what was going to happen with it. So you just kind of do it and see it and I thought, well the worst case, I just paint over it. Because that's how we come up with some of these things. We just try different things. It's only paint. 
And if you notice, I'm going in the way of the grain because that, that is going to, to help me to keep sort of that wood grain type look going on. Yeah, I'm using, using a lot. I love it. So it's not a one-step crackle. It's just your good old-fashioned traditional weathered wood. Don't use anything other than that. Unless you really you know, sort of want a funky crackled look. And get that hair going on in there. Cool. Could add to the look, you never know. Okay. And you notice, of course, with the crackle stuff, is you don't go over it. I think you can drag it out a little bit if you've got like a big puddle, but I wouldn't do too much more. Like, don't go back and forth like this way or anything. Because where it's sort of just not as puddled, you'll still get some cracks, but you won't get like a real sort of that really cool bubbly look that I got. And I didn't do here. You can if you want. That's sort of, you know, who's to say you can? I didn't, but you can. There, so I'm going to let that dry and we're going to see what uh, happens next. Okay, so I, I left it about two hours. I actually went for a walk and got my Starbucks. Um, one of the things I mentioned though is I do have a fan working right now so it might have speeded up my drying time. The fan is on because we have a lot of smoke in the air and it's what helps to keep it filtered. So give yourself, as long as it's dry to the touch, like if it's still tick, sticky or tacky, or like overly tacky, then you want to leave it a little bit longer. And hey, throw a fan on it if you want. I didn't use a heat gun, but I do have a fan running. So next what I want to do is I'm going to put my coat of the um, Vintage Effects on. And one of the brushes that I'm going to use, because I think I just love these, is the um, my Palmer. And I'm going to use my Palmer because I want to, like I could brush it on and then wipe some off, but because of the crackle, I found that I really just wanted to use it and get it onto the surface quite quickly without it um, puddling and stuff like that. Of course, because of the crackle, and it started off initially because I wasn't too sure what the crackle was going to do. So what I'll do is I'll just actually just put a little bit in the lid. There's no point in putting it anywhere else. And put my little brush in there. Just dip it in so I get a little bit on here. And then, dirty fingers, and just start painting. And what will happen is with, with the uh, using this Palmer brush is it will move the paint, take some of it off as well as, as putting it on. So it will thin it to give you that brush look. And I'm brushing also in the direction of the, um, of the crackle of the wood grain as well. And this, it actually starts to create, I'm going to actually zoom in for you to see how it looks on the crackle. It's so cool. Oops, too much. A little blurry there. And it actually, I'm going to do this with it close up. Because it will start to crackle. I don't know if you can see, as we watch it, some of these spots. You can always put the paint into like a, a styrofoam plate or something. I'm just going to do it out of here. And don't keep working in the same area. Pick up more paint. Move it around. And as you watch it, I will zoom back out here in a second. I just wanted to see if it would start to crackle already. And it is. A little bit down in here and you can't see my finger which means it's not there. Move it over. I think if you look you can see it sort of starting to crackle just a hint with the brush strokes and it ends up creating almost a, a vintage barn wood look effect. So we're going to go back. And it's like anything you know starting to crackle so you don't want to continuously work like in in the same area. Go to new places. Because if you brush over it once you've started your crackle, then you're going to defeat that. Because it's not going to give us any really big cracks, and I'm not too concerned about how much I'm going to get. 
like I said, it was it was hit and miss. I didn't know what I was going to get at the time, and it was just kind of a fun little thing. I liked how it turned out. And this brush, like it, because it does take some of the paint off at the same time as putting it on, it does stay thin. So you don't actually have to, uh, it holds a fair bit of paint. And then, just to finish it off, I do go across here. And see, I'm sort of dry brushing it, just having to take some of it off. Because all I want to do is I don't want to paint over it. I am just basically putting it on for sort of a wash, tone down the color look. And that's Miss Lily. If anybody's watched my videos before knows that we do meet Miss Lily during the recording process because she's barking at nothing. And she's really cute. You know, I'll insert picture somewhere. Sometimes I do. Miss Lily may know. And we don't know what she barks at because there's really nothing there. She sees it, we don't. She did meet her first deer in the window this year, which was, we always wondered, they come in the yard because we have urban deer. And I often wondered what she would do when she seed one. And it's a good thing she didn't meet it face to face because she was rather, tried to intimidate it, but it would have no part of that. So, and don't forget to do the sides. And this will not take long to dry at all. Probably, you know, I'm going to give it about a half hour just so it's not sticky. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to trace my pattern on. So, a little drying time. And sit back, watch the cracks, see what happens. And it's going to be really quite cool. Oh, I love it. Okay, we'll be back. Okay, so I've got my pattern traced on. And it is nighttime now. And unfortunately, I'm sorry I have some shadows. But... I wanted to get my texture paste on before, you know, so I could let it dry overnight. So in the fresh light in the morning, we can go ahead and do a bunch of other things. And this is actually going to be quite simple. I'm going to use, um, the, and you can use either the modeling paste or the crackle paste. Modeling paste is a little bit softer, kind of a rubbery feeling. It's great for a lot of things. I personally, you know, like I did with this for the corners, I prefer to use the crackle paste. So you can use either or, it doesn't really matter. We're just going to go ahead and create some texture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my any stipple brush. You know, I can use my I can use my dome uh, my dome round blenders. Uh, in this case for the size of it, I do like my half inch um, Deerfoot brush. So hopefully the shadows aren't going to get too much in the way. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a bit out on the palette I think. You can work from the jar but with my fans on I want to keep everything covered. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go in and I'm just going to pick up off of my palette and I'm just going to stipple. And if you notice on the face, I don't know if you can see it or not, maybe I'll move it up closer. Maybe. Um, you can see I've left the nose traced on. It, it was the only facial feature that I did trace on. And the reason for that is I didn't want to have the texture where I'm going to put the nose. And there's a reason for that because we're going to do some fun, fun things with the nose later. So I just go basically almost up as far as the corners as I can. Towards the edge without going over. It, you don't have to cover the entire surface. I just wanted to create a little bit of snowy sort of texture because he's a snowman. He's made of snow. And I just, you know, keep picking out some fresh stuff, just pouncing it out. I don't want it super thick. Um, it will give us a few little cracks, but it's just creates sort of a really unique dimension to the snowman. And the reason I like the deer foot is I can turn it for go towards my edges. And it doesn't, it helps me create a nice flat edge. And of course, you know, if you go over the edge and just take a, a Q-tip or a baby wipe and just wipe it off. And I'll zoom in on that so you know what I'm doing. Oh, it's got a little neck here. Pick that up too. Not much of a neck, just a little bit. So I'm going to zoom in just so you can get a better look. Zoom. Down. Sorry for the shadows. Oops, there we go. You see how I'm just creating 
you know, a little bit of depth. I'm just pouncing straight up and down, just creating just a little hint of texture. And, I, you know, I go as close to the edge, but if I don't hit the entire edge, that's okay. It doesn't really matter. And just, you know, up against the pencil lines. And so I'm just doing up here, and then we're going to do the lower part of her body down here. So go back where I need to be. Oh, yeah, get a nice look at this texture, too. Isn't this fun? And we're going to antique it after, which is going to be really cool. Ooh, nasty shadows. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then down here, same thing. And I'm going to leave this. This is snow. We're going to actually just put snow text down there, you know, when we're finished. The way I'm going to do this, there is a ton of base coating in this project. So throughout the video, you're going to see me just get to the point where I'm base coating this and this, that color, and then I'm going to, you know, do the base coating off camera. It seems it'll just make the, the, the class so long that it'll think you want to watch me base coat. So it's all about the, the different techniques that I'm going to use to, to sort of give a little modern mixed up flair to this traditional kind of sort of a shabby chicy primitive snowman and it you know it started quite by accident it was going to be totally different than this it's just when I did the, the green the revive for the background and then I started playing around with the vintage effects I figured what's the worst thing as I can just give it a light sand and try something different and it just the color just to me just screamed shabby chic so He's not as shabby chic as I would have liked, but you know what? We could add lace and, and all sorts of fun. Who knows where this is going to go? We've got a guideline with the original, original picture. And where he goes, nobody knows. We're just going to have a little bit of fun. So there. And this again, texture as well. And so that's going to dry. And it doesn't gonna take too long to dry. Probably, you know, for us it would probably take about an hour or so. but. Um, with me, I don't want to do too much with the shadows. But what I'm going to do next is we're going to shade. I'm going to show you how we're just going to shade and antique this background because I like that stuff to be on first so that when we paint our piece, it sort of sits over top of the background. It doesn't become, you know, we don't get the brown for the antiquing like onto the piece and stuff. So it's, it's just the way I paint in layers. So I'm going to go clean my brush and be right back for shading. Okay, so for shading, um, one of the things that I do really like to use is shop towel as opposed to paper towel. I'm not sure what, you know, I think we've all used various different things. I've used various different things, but it is all about the way it's folded, apparently. To me, it is anyway. Um, I fold up my little shop towel, put that up in the corner, and it's just more absorbent. Like, I can just use it forever and ever and ever, and that's what I really like. And so I got my shaders, and I'm very fond of... Uh, you do use my half inch. I'm extremely fond of my 3 8 angle shader. These are the black gold brushes. I use them all the time. Um, my, my preferential favorites actually, they're, they're just a really good, well-made quality brush. They've got the right snap in them that I like for bouncing back to where I need. Um, I can use them and use them in it. And actually, where I wear them down more by just wearing down the bristles to a point where there's hardly anything left on the side that I that I shade with, as opposed to um, them splitting or doing any, anything really bad. So um, they are my brush of choice. Swear by them. And I'm really hard on my brushes too. I do tend to leave them in water and do, they, they get like baths. They, I call it like baths, bath day once a month or something. You know, I keep them rinsed out, but I'm really bad for washing them as much as I should. So in that aspect, that is another thing that, that puts this brush up in my upper things. We're going to shade with Asphaltum and my shaders. I'm going to start with my 3 eighths. I like my 3 I can get a nice wide float, but of course you do whatever brushes that you are comfortable doing. Whatever your favorite go-to brushes are. It's just always fun to see what other people use. So with the Asphaltum, we're going to shade around the entire design. So what I just find a little spot that I like. And I'm going to float around the design. And my, I like my float sort of watery. And then of course comes the handy dandy mop brush. My favorite. 
can't work without my mop. I just love them. And I, I don't continue on in the same place where I where I ended off, just because I want that to dry before I go up to the next spot. And I just bounce around allowing my floats to dry a little bit before I go back and go over top. And I pull them along. I kind of skip my floats along. Clean my brush regularly. And I'm staying kind of with my blending. I, I, I do get a really messy palette as time goes by, but I do stick around in my one little corner. And the nice thing is, is that even if I do start a new float, when I mop it, it disappears. And if you worry, a little bit, take your baby, your finger, wet your finger, and just soften it out a little bit. And you know, I do this over top, like underneath before my painting, because it, for one thing, it allows you to get that nasty floating bit out of the way. And two, when you paint over top of it, most of it will disappear, so it starts to look, it does end up looking really tidy and really clean. And in all my instructions, I talk about this as I shade before I paint. It's just something I've always done. am precarious at most. There we go. So that is basic shading and so the second part of this is actually to do um, around the background a little bit to to make these pop a little bit and just to to add a little antiquing to this so what I'm going to do turn it around a little bit first is we're going to need two things I'm going to go with my bigger brush and we're going to go into the handy dandy baby wipes because these things are awesome and I will show you how I use those and you're gonna go oh my god I had no idea this is awesome because that's how we do things so I'm gonna start with my first big flow still with the asphaltum and I like this because it allows me to get a really nice soft float and to create sort of a little antiquing without going overboard so we start off with sort of our normal normal float and in this case, I'm just going under this ridge that's up here, but you know, it depends on the surface that you use. You're still going to do your corners. You're going to shade around your outside corners. But this is one of the things that's going to make that snowflake um, that we did up in the corner, it's going to make it stand out. And then if it gets too dark, we're going to dry brush a little bit. We're going to maybe put some stamps on here and just sort of have a little fun with it. Because, you know, you got to have some fun before you have to do all that hard work of base coating. We don't want to do all that base coating. So to start with, I'm going to do all the sides and then again you know see I'm not putting a lot of effort into it very quickly back down into here because that's going to be snow quick flip over So 
It's also going to go down into those cracks, which is going to be really cool. And you know, this is, you know, if you don't want to have this sort of antique prim look, then you don't have to do it. It's just sort of the way, I, the look that I like. See, no, no, I almost put this in water just to leave it there. Because that's what I do. Okay. Mop it out. Okay. So, it doesn't look like much. This looks like your basic boring everyday shading. But what I want to do, I'm going to take my little baby wipe. And we're going to do this gently. It's not something that we're going to do really heavy duty like and, and make it difficult and hard. Is I'm going to take my baby wipe and fold it maybe. I'm going to make a little little cheap pillowy thingy. Oh, fingers in there. I'm going to go into my asphaltum. Just pick it right up off the palette. And then I'm going to lightly brush, dry brush. Just kind of swirl it around up in these corners here. And it's going to sort of start to accent. And because it's 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 the baby wipe, it's not going to leave a lot of paint behind. It's going to take it off as well as apply it. So now I've got sort of a nice corner without putting on tons and tons of paint. And because it's a baby wipe, if it's going on really thick, you can actually wipe it right off and just leave a little bit of that, that look behind. So it's kind of a new take on something that was old. You know, just work a little bit into into the um, baby wipe, just a little bit, and go up and do the other corner. And I'm not scrubbing, I'm kind of going to go like a little bit of a sort of a rouging kind of effect. I'm going to need a little bit more. I'll just take it right off the palette in this little round bit because I don't want too much. I'm going to move around because there is moisture in this that I do want to come off. And you know, if, if you find that you've gotten too dark, just go back to a cleaner spot and it'll take off anything that you don't want. So you can add and delete, add and remove. What I want to do is try to enhance the um, snowflake a little bit. And we will dry brush. And there's, you know, I want to bring in a little bit more of the antiquing because I want some of the white snowflakes and stuff to show. See that? Look at that. Isn't that awesome? Just very light over my snowflakes. Just enhance them a little bit. So now you can sort of see them a little bit. If you want, just add a little bit. And that's it. I'm going to do here because I haven't done the pattern yet. But when the design goes on here for the at the very end for the berries and vines, I do want a little antiquing. So I'll do that and I'll do my, my edges as well, the bottom. If you're doing a canvas or something, it's the same thing. Just do around the outsides and the sides of the canvas. And same as up here. And it just tones it down. So basically I've lightened it and then I've darkened it. And this is just a neat, nice way to give it a quick, quick and dirty antique bit. Baby wipes. There. That's it. That's how fast that and how long did that take? No time at all. Okay. So put this away and toss that into the garbage. And of course, it's great because you can wash your hands afterwards. And what else is really cool? You want to save your palette. Look at that. We can clean our palette. We're not going to waste our palette paper. Oh, the things we learn. All right. Okay. So now we can start with some base coating. And I'm going to start with the snowman with a quick coat of buttermilk. Maybe. You know what? I have to go and get my papers. So we're going to leave it like this and we are going to 
not dart base. Go over and do the stamp. What was I thinking? There we go. Precarious. We're going to do a little stamping in the background. We're going to do it with some white. And that is actually is going to help us bring in a little bit more interest into the background because our background needs more interest. And the reason we're going to do it now is because if we get it on any of this stuff, we don't care because we're going to paint it. So these are absolutely amazing. And one of the things, you know, I've, I've tried several different things on how to load these. And I've done a brayer. A brayer works really good in most situations for me. But in this particular case, because I have fans going and it's a very, very, very dry climate here for me, I need to load mine with a sponge. And I'm just looking for a sponge. And various sponges. Not the sponge I want. Here we go. Those things are absolutely phenomenal. Another thing we can use is that. We can use, um, these things are handy dandy. These are the Tim Holtz blenders. Um, we could use like a sponge, but using these sponges here, I don't want to push too much paint down into the stencil because our stamp, it just makes it a little bit more difficult to clean. So we're going to work with these. And let's load it up. I'm going to turn my fan off. I hate to do that, but this will dry way too quickly. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take uh, some white paint, white, warm white, whichever one pops up first. It really doesn't matter. some white and these load up super fast and because even though it's huge it's an 8 by 8 um, stencil or stamp I mean sorry um, it's not going to go on perfect if I wanted it to go on perfect there is handles for them and then you can put like this nice flat perfect stamp we don't want to do a nice flat perfect stamp because we want to create something that is imperfect get some of those um, snowflakes on the go and so I'm going to load it very 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 quickly um, with me, I'm in a warm climate, very, very hot out, super smoky, surrounded by fires. Thank God we're not burning, but a lot around us are. So I'm going to go very quickly. And if I can't get the whole, the whole stencil, that's okay or stamp because I only need a part of it. So I'm just going to work with half right now. If you're in a climate that is allowing you to work a little faster, by all means, load the whole thing. And then, just take it, and we're going to plop that thing down, just like so. Just lay it down, put a little pressure. And even though the paint has gone down into the, sten the stamp, it's not going to come out on the, on the uh, surface. And this is where we say the little stamper's prayer. When I demo these <laughs> in, the, in the booth at Stampin', this is always hit and miss. It's really funny. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? So it's just a lacy, very pretty lacy stamp reload because you can only get it one time around. If you want some of they're called little ghost prints, like if you're doing it on paper or something and you've got the climate, that you can do that. You can get a couple of prints out of here and they just vary. They look really, really pretty. Okay. And I just usually turn it so it's a different way each time. But in this case, it's going over here doesn't have to be perfect and if it doesn't go on perfect and it's not that colorful don't worry about it it's only background we don't care oh just love it and then I can go and see if I got enough paint on there sometimes I do sometimes I don't hey we did good and I'm not I'm, I'm not afraid to use a lot of paint I want to make sure that they do have this fairly fairly juicy it does need to be juicy if I use a brayer um, with the paint and stuff, and it works on some of the other ones, but the snowflake is so delicate, it, it goes on so much easier with the sponge because of its, its delicacy. But usually I'll just use a brayer and it puts a very thin ink-like coat on and it's so pretty. Here. And I just love the look that these give. It's subtle, it's not super strong, 
just texture. And you know, if you don't want to use these, you can use any snowflake stencil or stamp. There are, um, there's another uh, Stampendous set. It's in the wash right now. My stuff ends up in the wash. Um, that just has the three little snowflakes, delicate cling snowflakes. They are awesome. Um, if you don't have snowflakes, use something else. Just don't do it at all. Whatever your little heart desires. Just anything to sort of create some fun. Let's see, you got more there. If you're not getting that. And it you fine. If you're not getting anything, just quickly add more paint. If it's not going to show up, it's not going to show up. And just plop it down. There. Now we're going to leave it for before we base coat. So with these things, the way to clean them is to wash them with soap and water. Just quick rinse under the sink, a little vegetable scrubber or something to scrub into it. If you let it dry like this, then it's going to be really hard to clean. If you are between it and you want to go back to it again in a few minutes and you don't want to take a lot of time, is I'll give it a quick wipe with a baby wipe just to get the excess paint off. And, um, you know, if you're doing this in a group or something and there's several of you, I just recommend getting a little, um, you know, casserole pan size with soapy warm water and just throw these in there between uses and then you can wash them all up a little bit later. So if you want to use it again, you just take it out you know, blot it with a paper towel, and you're ready to use it. All right, so we're gonna come back, and we're gonna set, every, set us all up with some base coating, and uh, we'll be back. Okay, so the shadows are gone, which is really nice, and well refreshed, I got my cup of coffee, and we're ready to paint the snowman. So I'm going to start with, um, now that he's dry, we're going to paint him with a base coat of light buttermilk. Hopefully. Light buttermilk. As you know, we are changing this guy up a little bit from the original photograph. And the reason for that is because I did paint him rather quickly. Had an idea in my head and then as, you know, once you paint him, I realized that there's so many other things that I could have done to make them so much more exciting so that's what we're gonna do it's gonna look pretty much the same but it's gonna be way more fun so just a quick base coat and it's the texture so you're gonna have to work a little bit harder to get that paint in there So now that we've got like the base coat on here, one of the neat things is because it is white underneath. So your, your base coat, if it's not perfect, it doesn't matter. Because by the time we do the shading and the dry brushing, it's going to uh, all blend in together anyway. So it doesn't need to be a 100% perfect base coat. And you can see already just by putting the coat of paint onto the head, how the shading in the background is all starting to sort of duck itself into the background and no longer be that prominent annoying brown blob. So there we go. And then we've got that. What we're going to do is we're going to use some pink paper. I did base coat this um, the the pinafore I guess it is the, the apron over apron or whatever with the design what I did is I painted it but you know I didn't really like it painted I tried several different pinks without it being sort of pink and blue and, and stuff like that and then I decided that I did have some really funky papers that I could use for the dress and I think that that's something that I want to do so we're going to go ahead and we're going to base coat the um, the shirt and stuff Get that. So this is the paper that I, I had initially planned on using and at the time I decided I wasn't going to use it and of course now I'm going to use it. And what's really cool is you can actually um, 
in the pattern pack it'll have the pinafore by itself on set for an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper so you can actually print the design right on it if you want to um, anyways paper studio available from Hobby Lobby it's pretty much standard you can get it anywhere um, anything with like the pinks and I thought this was kind of cute because it's kind of you know checkerboard we're going for a winter theme but we're not going for an all-out Christmas this this piece is for like I love snowmen so it's not uncommon I'll have them up all year round a lot of people like their snowmen all year round so this is what I'm going to use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to trace my bodice shape onto this. And we're just going to speed past all this. I'm going to trace the design and I'm actually going to trace the entire um, design onto the paper as well, like the snowman and all the little guys because we didn't have them on already. So we're going to do that. Okay, so that's cut out and we'll place that on after we paint. So, we're going to paint the shirt with Blue Heaven. That's kind of a pretty color. So we're just going to paint the shirt and the pinafore and stuff. We'll do all that first so that we can um, put the dress on last. I just think that works a lot better. And that way we can make a mess. We'll go over the edges just in case you cut your uh, shirt or your little apron pinafore thingy. Just in case you cut it a bit small. So I am going over the edges. That will allow me a little bit of, of play. Don't forget to do the little hat up here. It's the other piece that's mainly blue. What I tend to do is I like to go through and do all sort of base, do all my base coating at least with one coat. In this case, I'm doing two because I know what I'm doing. And, and but when I'm designing, I'll quite often just put one coat because I'm not too sure as I go along just what color. I'm going to finish off with. You know, sometimes I might change it. So, the only other thing that is painted the same blue is this little present down here, this little gifty down here. So, we might as well throw a coat of blue paint on that. Mm -hmm. So, that's what I'll do is I'll look for everything. Even when I paint a uh, pattern packet of another designer as well, so I'll go through and look for everything that's all the same color. As long as it's the base layer, like the first layer, because my designs are done in layers. We don't, you know, I don't tend to work on one particular part and then uh, finish it all up with my shading and details and stuff until I'm done because it's not uncommon that I'll start with one color. And once I get everything together, I discover that, no, it's not going to work. And then we start changing color. So when I've done it all with one base coat, then I know that I'm going to be basically happy with it. Okay, so there we go. So now what we're going to do 
is we're going to adhere the uh, the dress. We're going to use the Deco Art Matte Medium. And I love the Deco Art Matte Medium, and I've talked about this in other patterns that I've done. Is what I like the most is that I can, once it's applied, it becomes a sealer, an adhesive, and you can actually um, paint over top and wipe it right off again with a baby wipe. So it's great for when you're shading and doing other things because it allows you sort of a little bit more time to play. It's one of my favorite things ever. And I really wish that DecoArt would come out with this in a bigger container. So, But anyway, the DecoArt matte medium. You can use the decoupage um, mediums like the matte the, the matte me, uh, decoupage mediums and stuff like that, they do tend to leave a little bit of a coating. So I'm not saying that you can't use it or you couldn't adhere this down with, you know, um, white, you could glue it on if you wanted to, like with a glue stick and stuff like that. With the matte medium, it just adheres everything. Like there's, you're not going to get pages, pieces that are going to lift up or anything, but you could, you know, you could use your glue stick on the bottom and adhere it into place if that's what you're comfortable with, if you're into paper crafts and stuff. But the way I like to do it is this way, and then I end up with it so stuck to the surface that you can't even tell that there is anything else there. You, you, you can't see it. I love this. This is just a, an encaustic, uh, cheap, cheap brush from Dynasty. Um, this is for the encaustic stuff. They're, they're so dirt cheap, it's not funny. But they are amazing for the matte medium. And see, I'm just blotting it on where I want it. Because I'm going to work, and notice I'm holding it down with my hand. So I've placed it into place where I want it. Then I'm going to hold it down with my hand. I'm going to apply my matte medium on the first part, and then I'm going to stick it down. And I've not taken this hand off the bottom because this way it's not going to move. And then I'm going to take my matte medium and go over top. And it's going to stick the entire piece down. And because it's matte, once it's on, you can't see it. Once it dries, it, it's matte, it's clear. So this is how I work with a larger piece. It's like, you know, if you're peeling and sticking something down, you start from part of it and then you slowly peel. It's basically the same process. And I'm not being shy with my medium because I am going to show you how we take it out from underneath. But because this is a textured surface, it's going to be better that we put Fairbin on. And see I'm going over top of it as well. I'll show you how we're going to fix all that. There are a few bubbles. You can see them but don't fret on them right now. Don't even try to take them off. Okay. And see I've gone over it quickly. So now, it's adhered, but there's bubbles and stuff. So this is where we go into our handy dandy room keys, old credit cards, anything like that. Like here's an old room key from, uh, I don't know, one of the Holiday Inns. This is what I'll do. I take it and I will work those bubbles out. So almost working from the center towards the outside. And if you get little bubbles like these, don't worry about them because your paper is wet. They will go down. And also there's a little bit of texture to this piece as well because of the, uh, there. So you just work slowly, pull some of those bubbles out, like wallpaper. I don't do it too hard because bear in mind, depending on the paper, this is the, um, the paper from Hobby Lobby. It's thick enough, but if you use some of the papers that are thinner, they may not go on quite the way you want. Once it dries, some of these little bubbles will disappear, and sometimes they just become part of the piece. Not to worry about. But to finish it off, is I will go, and you know what, I'm going to show you this because I'm going over the entire thing. The reason I'm going to do this is when I do my shading, we can wipe it right off. And it's actually going to seal everything, so it's going to just adhere it all, give it one nice coat of the same. But 
but primarily I put it over the paper because the paper will soak up like if you don't seal the paper it will soak up your floats and this way your floats go on really soft I'm gonna go over this too why not it's not base coated yet but when we do the paper nothing is going to seal not, none of the paint is going to soak into it so you get that sort of blotty blotchy weird looking um, floats and if you make messy floats we just wipe them off smooth it out and there you go so we're gonna let that dry it doesn't take long and see once it's wet with the um, medium on the top you can work some of these bubbles out because it's it's wet enough and your finger will slide but I'm not too worried about them. There would be a big snowflake in that spot anyway, so it happens. Not a big deal. There you go. So we let that dry, and then we're going to come back and, and do some fun more stuff. More base coating because we love it. So that dried in about, you know, it was dry within about 20 minutes, so it doesn't take very long at all. There's still a little, a few little bumps, but I'm not going to worry about those at all because it's, it is paper. So it, it's irrelevant. Don't worry about it. A wrinkle just becomes part of the dress. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start doing a little bit of shading before we go into our additional base coating. And um, what I want to start with is the dress because I'm going to shade around the entire design. So we're going to shade that with a boysenberry pink. Just because it's a pretty pink. And with my course, my... 3 8 inch angular shader because I have to in my paper towel and I keep my floats fairly light if we hadn't sealed this when we float you'll get these little bleeding bleeding marks and, and we don't want the little bleeding marks so this is just going to give it a nice little soft pink now if you were concerned that your your um, paper wasn't quite pink enough and it was a little more on the white side, what I would suggest doing is just a very light wash of um, cotton candy, right here, cotton candy. You could give it a wash with that if you wanted to tone down maybe the design that you did have in your paper. It would just, it helps to just bring, sort of incorporate the color palette even though your paper is going to have a, a really pretty design on it. And of course you can get your trusty mop out. So I am going to go around my design just like I did originally with the um, asphaltum on the background. I always shade around everything first. doesn't matter what it is. It's just sort of a thing I do. You can certainly paint my designs without doing any background shading if you're not a, a person that likes to do floating because I know some people it's an F word. I love it and you know I find it makes good practice for um, for floating because it does it, it does basically disappear so it does give you a chance to practice your floating when you should be and who knows one day you kind of get that happy little aha moment and you're like wow I did that And of course, you know, I'm going to have to turn it around. Do this little hat first. And I pull my floats towards me. That's why you see me. And I know some painters, and I've watched videos of people painting, they can do these back floats. I cannot. So I turn everything upside down. I'm going to show you, just watch this. This is the difference of having um, having the matte medium on. Say I didn't like it, and I'm just doing this as an example. Look, I can wipe it right off. It isn't going to affect anything. So that's just showing you 
no, that's wet there. Just showing you how, you know, if you put a matte medium, and you can do it over top of any painted piece. As any design, any pattern packet that you're working on, when you do all your base coating and you're not a person that is, is comfortable floating, then just put a coat of matte medium over top. It is so thin, and, and actually you can do several coats of it through the course of a painting and you can't even feel that it's there. Whereas if you were to use a varnish or um, a, de uh, what, a decoupage mediums and stuff like that, I guess, you will eventually get a buildup. With the matte medium, you don't get a buildup. That's why I, I swear by it like I do. And this is staying fairly soft. Which is also one of the things, if the paper, and I'm going to show you actually, I'll grab a piece of the dry paper. This is a piece of the paper dry. Now without the matte medium on here, if I was to do floating on the, the paper, see how it, it, it's actually going to, I'll bring this up to the camera, it starts to bleed into the paper and you get the sort of that blotchy textured look. So that is why we use the matte medium. I discovered that one the hard way and I just fell off. Plus, you know, if you've ever um, done something with the decoupage medium and then tried to trace your pattern on and you find that you can't, you can trace over this, this matte medium no problem because it is so thin. And I'm going to just tuck in these back corners here because that's shadows underneath. And I'm, I'm just using the tip on my brush because I want them a little bit darker. So I'm just sort of watercoloring in there. That is the fold over. Okay. So that is shaded. And it, it just becomes very soft, very nice. And now we're going to shade the... the um, the hat and the dress and that's going to be done with Victorian blue which is a pretty blue first I have to find it right there it's a Victorian blue and when I'm picking colors, I don't know if people realize it, when I'm picking colors for, for designing, what I do is I look at the backs of them and see how they, how they um, affect each other. Like an example, here is my pinks. What I'll do is I'll pull them all and I put them upside down. And this is actually something that Kim Christmas showed me years ago. And so all of these are basically in the same tone and that is how I pick, pick my colors. So if you were to take, say, you know, you, you wanted to paint something with boysenberry pink and you wanted to know, okay, what color do I shade with? You can look at the shading guides on Decor. It does give you a little bit of, of guideline on that. But what I do is I just find, I take my base coat color, I find a highlight color, and I'll find a shading color. And I just work in the tones. And then I go, because I have to do everything twice, then I'll find a color that shades this one darker and whatever shades this one lighter. So you find that they're all basically in the same tones but they get lighter as they go whereas you know if it's not quite the right shade it'll it'll kind of stand out you put all your paints this way and whatever one doesn't go you take out so that's our little interesting tip of how i figure out all my shading colors that's how i come up with the things i do okay so we're going to shade with victorian blue now on the blue stuff Then we're going to go and do some more of that horrible base coating. So I'm going to shade down here. And once again, you know, I'm just bouncing around because I'm going to have to turn this around. So I'm finding all the places that I can go by pulling towards me.
And I am using the entire brush. The water that I have in, in the rest of the brush is what is pulling the paint out. When a lot of people use an angular shader, they tend to want to twist it upwards and go like this, and then you get that dark shade. We don't want that. What I do, oh, by the way, because I did put the matte medium on, I did an icky float, it just wipes right off. See? Cool. So that's why I keep the entire brush, and that's why I like my angle shaders. I keep the paint loaded just in the tip and the rest of it with water, and it allows me to move those floats around almost like a watercolor, if that makes sense. And then when I mop, I just start from the outside work towards the center. And I mopped and I got a little bit of blue on here, so I can just take my baby wipe, clean that up. It's gone. Trust me, matte medium is your best friend. Hey, going upside down. Okay, so that's basically the gist of the first shading. Nothing great. We'll just finish up the top of the hat here. And another thing at this point, you know, you always go back to when I'm teaching the classes, I always tell people, because sometimes you're not going to draw the lines there, I always tell people, keep your um, your line drawing handy keep that on your table close to you so you can see what you've missed so in this case there is a uh, she does have a little you know separation on her shirt because her shirt does button up so pop that in there clean your mop off between between stuff and then we'll just finish this off Watch me go backwards. I don't do this very well. Which isn't going to matter. That's going to have a ruffle on it anyway. So, Okay, so that is how that part gets done. And this is going to be... Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. Okay, so now we're going to shade the... Uh, shade the snowman body. I just want to get a little bit of the shading in before we start doing the rest of the base coating. So the snowman body, I'm going to shade with espresso.
And because he's textured, I'm actually going to go into my bigger brush because it'll allow me to get nicer floats to uh, blend in a little bit. We'll start down here. And because it's, it's soft, it actually will sort of work itself into the texture a little bit and uh, soften itself up quite nicely. So we're going to go under the hat. And also because the matte medium is on here too, it is allowing it to spread a little nicer instead of sort of creating any dark blobs because we don't want dark blobs. See how soft that goes with the medium on there? I'm going to go around the nose. And I wanted the nose sort of left without the texture, and you know, because it, it isn't made of snow, it's made of carrot. See, and it goes quite a ways. So, of course, now we have to flip it around. Try not to knock everything over. You know, I would pick the, uh, the biggest surface I had to paint on. We don't go all the way around the head because he's going to be a little bit brighter down in here. So I kind of start halfway. Just pop that up in there. Other side of his nose. There, look how easy that was. So simple. No time at all. We'll put it back. One of these days I know the camera's going to go flying. Just you wait. Yeah, it's not going to be good. Okay, just chat oh yeah, along the bottom. Because we're everything that's going to get shaded along the bottom because it's got snow, right? So let's get to tuck this in. Okay. So once that's done, the next thing I do with my snowman usually is to just dry brush them. There's only two or three steps to doing the little snowman. And when I start to dry brush them, I will dry brush them with um, warm white. And when I dry brush, I have several different brushes that I like to use. I like to use mine. These are absolutely amazing. These are the new Mezzaluna brushes from um, Dynasty Brush. Absolutely love them. Another thing I use a lot is my dome blenders. So any stiff brush for dry brushing, I am just in love with these. So I'm going to show you how these work. These, they just got a great, they are stiff bristle and what I like about them as opposed to these ones which have a softer finer hair in them is that I can wet this. I can actually get this wet and it'll dry very very quickly. So I'm going to show you how I dry brush with both. I'll do one with one and, and the other with the other. So I just load my brush up. With the Mezzaluna brush I'll just work my paint in off of my palette. I'm not sure if you can see that there. Don't, I don't even need to blot it as long as I look at the brush and there's not a pile of paint on it. I can just start my dry brushing. And I'll just dry brush almost in a crisscross. And with the texture, 
the mezzaluna is so much nicer because it actually works itself right onto the texture so much better. I do all my snowman this way. Pick up a little bit more paint. And see, I don't even need to, to take it off on paper towel. If you have a blob of paint on the end, then of course you would. But I'm just like crisscrossing. Um, it can dry brush um, sideways. Like I can go like this and rouge it too. Both work. You can just pull. These are great for like doing pumpkins and stuff too because you can get nice, nice dry brush pulled, dry brush look. So that's that one. And I can wash this now and it'll be ready to use um, very, very quickly. So then the other one is my uh, Dawn Blenders. Same thing as I load them up with the paint. But the only difference with the Dawn Blender is that I do need to take a little bit of paint off just to make sure that it's not wet. And I rouge this one. And I'm getting the same look. Just going sideways, rouging. Get a little bit more paint. So you can use basically any brush that's going to be dry for you. Load it up. Just tapping it just to make sure that I don't have any large blobs of, of paint. And I start off lightly. Just by starting off lightly, if I'm going to get a large blob of paint, I'm going to find it then. And I can also crisscross this one as well. I find for the larger texture pieces that my Mezzaluna brush does work a lot faster. And when I'm on my palette, I do tend to like work it into the brush so that when I take the brush, it's not got globs of paint on it. Just work it out on a dry palette. You never get these wet. You don't want water in these brushes. So there. And so while I have this brush out, and of course my Mezzaluna, both of them still have paint on them. But what I want to do is I want to dry brush her cheek. So I don't even need to wash either of these. I'm going to take my uh, Mezzaluna, or this one, we'll do and I'm going to pick up a little bit of the shading color, which was the um, boysenberry pink, and blend it into my brush. And pick up a little bit of white too. I want it just to be a soft pink. So I'm just going to blend that out on my palette. And then I'm going to take it on paper towel and I'm actually going to take off more than I did with the white because I want to have this brush like very, very, very dry. And then very softly, start softly and dry brushing those cheeks. And I want them sort of round. I do want them pink, but not, you know, screaming hooker cheeks. I want them pink enough that when we do the, can the white swirl at the end, that it'll show up. So that's one with that one. And to show you, you're going to get the same look. We'll do this one as well. And you know, when you brush mix your paint, you just keep mixing with a little bit of each color till you get the same color as what was in that spot before so you don't have to do these even mixes of paint same as this one take the brush off make sure it's not wet and this one and then I'll use it on its side so I'm going to get a little bit of a different look I like this blended look better which means I'm going to go back to this brush and finish that because I liked how it was it was blending it into into the texture the Mezzaluna is, is keeping a lot more of the paint on top of the texture, which I really like. But when I want to create these amazing cheeks that she's going to have, I want it actually worked in to be nice and soft. So, either or. Okay, so that is some cool, funky cheeks. And I'm going to rinse them off and set them aside. I do have a tendency to leave them all in water, but we won't do that. Just rinse them and set them aside. And I did get blue paint on my dress when I was shading, so I'll take some of that off. Okay. So now, 
we are going to highlight the blue, the blue chiffon. We don't need to do any highlighting on the dress because we already have that, but I will do some white dry brushing on it like towards the end with when I add like the final details. So with blue chiffon, we're going to highlight the dress. And do a little dry brush. In the, in the instructions, I'll mention dry brush and float highlights with. And that's usually when I mean we're going to dry brush if it's required. And we're going to float our highlights. So in this case, we're going to float these highlights on the top of, of her dress. Now, if you can bring your floats down, like I've done there, then you don't need to dry brush. But if you end up with sort of a, a defined section in the middle, then you are going to want to dry brush. The top of the hat. So any of the high points. There. And you notice I don't always get my brush wet. Sometimes there's more than enough paint already on my, my uh, paint and water on my brush that I don't have to uh, get it wet each time. That's what I like about the shop towel. For me, it takes just the right amount of water off. Quickly that goes. Now I'm going to, of course, turn them around because I have to. So when the dry brushing comes into effect is when it dries and you take a look at it and you're seeing a defined line that defines three different colors, that's when I'll dry brush because the dry brushing will, will start to blend those colors so that there is no defined line. Or sometimes I just want that brighter pop of color. And up here, because that's the other side of her shading, her dress, buttons. And make sure when you, with the video you're painting along with me, but whenever you're doing my patterns, make sure that you read the, um, read through the instructions because I do shade and highlight quite often twice depending on what I'm doing. So like in this case, that highlight is not overly bright. And the reason for that is because I'm going to do a brighter highlight later with white. So always read through, don't keep working at it to try to get that, that perfect blend of light and dark. Everything is done twice. Most people, you know, the floating word. There. Now if you wanted to dry brush, just to pop those up with the light blue a little bit, I just go and get myself another one of these little blenders. Get another one of these. I have tons of them. Pick up some, some blue chiffon. Go to my little dry paper towel. Notice I'm not using the white one. And then I can just kind of define some of these. So I would go in here just to soften like any shading edges or whatever. If you have the, those uh, nasty floating lines, which we tend to get from time to time, this will help fix that. If you're prone to those nasty floating lines, then, then uh, use matte beading. Yeah, just sort of accents it a little bit right in here, places that you want. There. And then lids. So that's basically your, your first level of everything on where that goes. So now we're going to go into base coating, get the rest of the stuff base coated. And I'm going to start with the little snowman. He's going to be the same color as what we had used before, which is uh, light buttermilk. So with this, you're just going to see me list base coat and the color that we're going to use. And I'm just going to um, fast forward through the entire video with each color. We're going to use whatever brush fits the surface the way we like it. I'm going to bounce between this one and I'm going to bounce between probably a number eight because that'll get me into my candy canes just nicely. My light buttermilk.
It's going to take two coats over the paper. And just for fun, I'm going to show you a little, a little trick that I've started using. And the reason for this really is I've been painting a lot on a lot of really bright, bright backgrounds. So when I paint on like textured backgrounds or those bright ones that I've been doing for mixed media, I go into gesso. Gesso is also your friend, like matte medium. You can get it in pretty much any brand possible. I'm going to take a little bit of gesso and I'm going to put it on my palette. Just take some out, put it away. This also creates great textures and stuff too. Gesso. You can get a really light or really um, thick. So what I'll do is I will take a little bit of gesso and if I base coat with a brush mix of gesso with a little bit of, of like the paint with a little bit of the gesso in it, it'll actually give me a better first coat and it'll help to hide that texture because I don't want it in there. This is one of the little tips that I've been doing. I actually use gesso a lot more now than, than uh, sealers. I'll use it for my backgrounds. Once you start using gesso, if you're like me for years, you went, I don't know what gesso is. It's for canvases and stuff. I started using it because of course the deck where it's media line, which I'm madly in love with. And it just found that it was so nice to put that first coat on. And especially if you want to do, um, if you can paint any of the bright colors right over top as well of gesso. So if you want to paint like a bright red or something like that, if you do a coat of gesso first, that red will just pop, especially over dark back, dark backgrounds where it's really hard to get your brightness back. Anybody's been looking at any of my more recent patterns, you're seeing this happen a lot more. I'm mentioning gesso in my, my supply list. Sometimes I'll, I'll brush mix it with the base coat color and other times I'll just use it, it straight up. So that's the first coat on those guys. And now we are going to start with our base coating of these guys. So I'm just going to fast forward through these. Start and I'll list the colors. The colors are going to pop up on your video. But basically we're using cotton candy, wisteria, and green tree, which is one of the new colors. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so we're back. Everything's done, base coated. So now we are going to do um, the dreaded shading. But before we do the dreaded shading, we do need to put a few pattern lines back on. Just a few, not too many. Because I, like I said, I shade around everything. So we're going to put a few of these little lines back on. And things like snowflakes and stuff, I do freehand those, you know, that's, that's your choice if you want to, you know, go to all the trouble of tracing them on, you know, you can. They're kind of more fun if you just make them up as you go. So I'm going to put my little, these little designs on, because I do shade around them. any lines back that you need because we're going to need these lines so that we know where these things are shaded. cases you can still see your lines through from underneath so that's okay and then I always just move because things tend to change how they're laid out so I do move things around a little bit just to make sure that I get them lined up where I want but no matter how hard you try it does change it moves around Okay, so I'm going to need my patch on the snowman and just a few little lines on the snowy so that we know where he's going to go. And of course, we're going to need a little nose. So he always needs a nose. And he's going to be shaded under here and he's going to be shaded under there. He's got a little patch. Put that on. Oh, I'll put little arms on. So he needs arms. And this candy corn, candy canes. I'm going to show you actually a fun little trick with those. No, we're not. There's no trick. So we're going to put the lines on because we want to be able to paint the red lines on. Might as well go up here, put a little eyeball where they should be, I'm thinking. And see if you look down, it actually doesn't line up, and I'm just lining up each piece as I go, because that's just the way it happens. Who knows why things happen like they do. Eyeball there. And an eyeball there. Alright. And I'm going to mark off the tree over here since I have all this out because this branches do come over the snowman. And you see, I moved it around again. We're going to do some shading in here for the wrinkles. It's got a few wrinkles. I'm going to mark them in, but I'm not going to do them really dark. I'm just going to kind of like just give myself a little indicator of where I want them, but not overly dark. I'm not putting a lot of pressure on it. I just want them really, really faint. Just enough so I can see. All right. So it's faint, but we can see them, and that's all I really want. Because when I, and I did not put the snowflake on. So when I start shading, and we will start with the boysenberry. We're going to start with all the, the pinks down here. 
skirt on the boxes. Everything like the, the dress and the and the shirt already have their one one floats on already. So we're gonna get the pinks done. You can listen to me natter or we can listen to jazz. I got a little jazz music playing in the background. It's soft. I kind of like it when it's just, I want peace and quiet. It's calming and relaxing, which I quite like sometimes, not all the time. Okay, I'm going upside down. tricky make sure when you, when you do your back your floats in there that you do let one dry before the other and what we'll end up doing is darkening now darkening the top of the boxes a little bit more when I do the deeper shading with the second hopefully I'm keeping this on camera a little trickier then. See how that works? Let's go back in with your finger, take it off real quick. There we go. See, we all make mistakes. Everybody makes boo boos. Matte medium. Just say it. And I do walk my floats out a little bit in the corners. I don't know if you've been noticing that or not when I do my shading. So I'm not getting like a square box. And I use the watery end of the brush to pull them out a little bit, like by keeping my brush entirely flat. See? Keep it flat like this for so the water. There's actually a fair bit of water in there. But when I mop very softly, mop out that watermark. All right, I had what I wanted to fix up here because I had sort of washed it off a bit. Okay, so that's the first shading for the pink. I might as well leave them upside down. We're going to go and do the green, and I'm going to use holly green to shade the start of the green. And at this point, this is where I'm going to have to start shading around my little my little things that I have on there, which are not showing up very much right now, but that's okay, because that's the way we like it. In most cases, I do two shading, but on this particular one in the green, I'm not, because I'm, it, the colors work so well together by themselves. Usually, I, I do my second shading because I like the transparency of the darker color in a lot of cases, but sometimes, Sometimes I just want, and I'm just going to use the tip of this to fill this in under here. Sometimes I just want to have, let the colors work because they are strong enough on their own. And in this particular case, these colors are strong enough on their own. I like depth. Of course, we're going to go under. Turn around. Oops. Do this here. Every time it goes by, you see that I have painted the back side of this as the original. 
I'm going to do my shading in here on the uh, candy cane. That's another reason why, because I am shading around it. It's a small spot, so it's losing color. I'm using my my medium color actually to dry brush, and, and it'll create its own look for me. It's all this tedious bits. What is she doing? Why is she doing that? Basically because I can. I can't leave it alone. It, it needs to have all these little things done. Otherwise it would just be plain. And the bottom here. Again, jumping around so that I give things a chance to dry. Do oh, you see the shadows? That is the sun coming out. Finally. Not the, we had a little bit of rain today, put some of the smoke away. So I'll fix that up a little bit without knocking my camera over. Alright. You know I want the sun, but speaking. We had just enough rain. Not enough to put fires out, but just enough to knock down the smoke a little bit. And yes, sorry to say it, but I'm going sideways. But we are going to go upside down. Can you see my Starbucks? Look at that. I went for a walk today. Oh, Starbucks. I'm in love with those passion tea lemonades. Pretty soon, but it is hot. It is pumpkin spice season, but it's 30, 30 degrees Celsius out. I'm not quite ready for my pumpkin spice yet, but oh, it's pumpkin spice season. Happy day. in there somewhere and under of course I'm also a painter that I clean up as I go so when things are messy and they do tend to be messy I just clean them up as I go and it just seems to work it helps So never ever worry about, you know, everything being perfect and I do uh, a little line of work at the end of all my projects which to me it cleans up all those little things that I botched or, you know, screwed up a little bit. Okay, so that is the green, uh-huh, I think I got it all, I do, oh, here. Okay, so next we're going to do purple, and we're going to do that with grape juice. And it floats with that. Same thing, we're going to go here. On the original line drawing, I have the the boxes over top of the dress. When I did the dress with paper, I just thought it would be kind of fun to have it over top because the box and her are kind of sitting side by side, so the, the apron is kind of floating up over top of the box a little bit. It's up to you. If you want to tuck it in behind and cut around it, you can. I just thought, you know, it looks like it's tucked in there, so that'll do. And of course, we got to go down around this guy. And if you notice, you know, don't worry about these floats being perfect either because when I'm going to dry brush these, 
which is going to tone them down and clean it up a little bit as well. If anybody's looking at this going, oh my gosh, Deb's floating, it's so messy. It is, but that's okay. The other reason why I do the second float is it cleans everything up as well. There's many reasons why I do some of the things that I do. Do my thing. We're going to just finish up in here in the top of the roof on the box lid. And I'm almost just filling it in with a watercolor because it, it is going to be darker than the rest of it anyway. And I'm going to deepen this one just a little bit more more of a watery color because it's bigger. Here. Okay. So now those are done. So the next step would be to highlight them, which is always step two. And so when I highlight again, we're going to do a combination of highlight and dry brush. It depends on, on what it is that I'm doing. And in this case, I want to dry brush in here. So I'm going to be doing the dry brushing. And I'm going to be doing floating on the box lids with the pink chiffon. So I'll do my highlights first, and then I'll go and do some dry brushing. Mm -hmm. And this also, as you see, cleans up any of the messes that I had. I'm going to enhance the box a little, little bit. Fix them a little bit too. I want it a bit more defined in here. And this is what you can do. You can use this to define it. So in here, the snowflake's going to go here, so I don't want to make it too dry, but I want to just add a little hint of a bit more color into that. So I'm going to take one of my dry brushes, not one of the ones that's wet, but one of the dry ones, and of course my dry paper. I'm just going to dry brush this a little bit. And then just dry it lightly enough because I want to pull the texture. Use the texture that's in the background to sort of create a little bit of a interest. 
onto the uh, the box. Just a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so that's that one washed, put away. Next, we're going to go into the green, and the green is going to be done with uh, highlighted and dry brushed with uh, light lime. These are some of the colors from the new palette, um, 2017 release of the new colors, and I actually use quite a few of them. I really like them. Sometimes, you know, it's nice to change things up, try some different colors. Same thing, floats and highlights. And then I'm going to dry brush this guy. It's another one of these brushes that's dry. And I think we will use this one this time. Yeah, it's dry. My Mezzaluna. Work the paint really well into my brush. Make sure that excess. And again, lightly dry brush. See with this one, because of the color palette, I probably and normally would have used the light lime as my base coat and then shaded with the holly and then deepened. Or shaded with green tree and then deepened. But because I needed more of the green to show up because of the white on here, I chose not to. Chose to do it a different way. Just a little bit around. Here and there. Oops, I forgot my little thingy there. Next is the uh, purple. Same thing, we are going to use soft heather. And if you want it, I suggest you pick it up because I do believe it's coming up on a discontinued color list. Uh, I've had a glimpse of one, so I'm not 100% sure, but if you see one, grab it. It's in all my patterns. It's one of those colors that I use all the time. And I'm very sad to say that it will be, or has potential to be, discontinued. Very sad. If you can't find, um, if you can't use the soft heather, just use the um, pink chiffon. There's not enough difference between the two when I do my highlights that you can get away with using the other. And I've, I've done it sometimes, just because I've been too lazy to go look for my soft heather. And you can't tell. And dry brush. Another brush. I've got them everywhere. Same thing. Work it into the brushes. I always find the first float on all my pieces is extremely boring. What happens after that when I get into the, the deepening floats and stuff, that's when it gets exciting. Okay, so same thing. Just dry enough to bring out some of that texture. So now we're going to go back and we are going to shade the snowy. You know what? We're not going to shade the snowy. We're going to do base coating. We're going to go back and do these base coatings, but I do need to put my candy cane back on here because I missed it. So there is actually a little candy, like these candies. There's one over in here. I had to put him back on there. He fell away. It happens to you. And I'll do a quick float around it. So I think it's no mistakes. Happy accidents. Because yeah. it was so faint, that's all. Alright. 
So I'll do a quick float around that with the green. Even though I've done my dry brushing, that's okay. And if you look at the piece now, do you see how all that shading that we did originally is tucked away into the background and gone? All just falling into the background. It's pretty cool. Okay, so these guys need to be painted the same color as those and the mitten needs to be blue. So we might as well get those base coated. Well, else we can. And I'm just going to go ahead and base coat those and then... Uh, We'll come back and do all our shading.